I just spent five weeks building these retro computer speakers. I thought this would be a simple project, but boy was I wrong. I'm calling these the mid 90s, after the movie. A speaker I designed to blend 90s nostalgia with modern sound. In this video, I'm gonna show you the journey I went through designing and building these speakers multiple times. But to understand where this all started, first we have to meet Dr. Robert. He isn't just the world's biggest classic Mac enthusiast. He's also my cousin. I know, the resemblance is uncanny. Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Hearn, a lecturer in IT at Murdoch University. Part of my work, I'm also a gaming historian. Beside me, I have my LC575, my very first computer from 30 years ago. All right, so what do you want these speakers to do? I want them to be able to play quality mono sound with a reasonable amount of bass and to be able to finally have some good speakers with this machine since the internal speakers are a little bit flaky after 30 years. After chatting further with Robert, he told me he wanted me to base the speakers off these old Apple design powered speakers to match the aesthetics of his Mac. Designing speakers based on these bits of plastic from the 90s might seem like an odd idea, but I love it. It gives me a big dose of soldier whenever I see one of these. They take me back to my 11 year old self, pumping the gorillas and asking the big questions like, if I send my sim to the pool and remove the ladder, what will happen? By today's standards, these speakers sound pretty bad. And a quick measurement shows the engineering is lacking. That line is supposed to be close to flat. And there's a reason small computer speakers like this have fallen out of fashion. Making bass with a tiny speaker like this is hard. As the box gets smaller, you lose bass, even if you keep the same tuning frequency. And to keep that low tuning frequency needed to make deep bass, you have to make the port longer, the smaller the box gets. And as is way too often the case, the solution to this problem is money. Drivers with tiny little motors like this, they don't make much bass in small boxes. But drivers with big motors like this, this driver works great in small boxes. But this driver is like 15 times the price of this one. And the budget and the catalogs are just filled with drivers like this, with weak motors that cannot make bass in small enclosures. But there is a diamond in the rough. This is the Dayton ND91. Its little motor looks small, but it's packed with neodymium magnets. These magnets are more than 10 times stronger than ceramic magnets. Even in a little one liter box, we can get decent bass using this driver. It's not the cheapest little driver, but it's not the most expensive either, and we're gonna need it to make our little speaker work. I'm gonna pair the ND91 with this little tweeter, and we're gonna power everything with this little plate amp. The plate amp comes with these front panel controls and Bluetooth, which we're gonna need as headphone jacks are fading from existence. Here's my design. It's inspired by these Apple speakers, but I've changed proportions a bit because I've always felt they look a little bit awkward and tall. The port's longer than the speaker is tall, so I've folded it up to help it fit. I've also decided that slicer generated supports are evil. They print inconsistently, especially when you distribute the plans to a whole heap of people who all have different printer setups. So from now on, all my new designs will be support free. To make that work here, I'm going to print the speaker on its back. And where this overhangs in the round port, I'm going to make it this teardrop shape. Printing an entire speaker without supports is a little bit scary, but let's see how it goes. Yes, my 3D printer is in an actual jungle. Oh, it's looking so good. Perfect. I'm pretty happy with how this came out. I mean, the port printed, no supports, no problem. The only issue is, is the tolerance is a little too tight to push the sections together and the woofer doesn't really fit in the cutouts. So make a few tweaks to the front baffle reprint and we should be good to measure. All right, the first prototype is done. It's a bit of a mishmash of a whole bunch of different leftover filaments, but it all fits together really nice and it'll work for taking measurements. I took 146 measurements of this speaker, covering 360 degrees both horizontally and vertically for the tweeter and the woofer. This might sound like stupid overkill for a speaker like this, but as you'll soon see, the better your measurements are, the better your crossover will be. It took me less than an hour and it's basically free sound quality. I finished taking the measurements and one thing really stands out. The tweeter shows a whole heap of odd peaks and dips in the lower treble. What's super interesting is that if you look at the woofer, it shows the exact same peaks and dips. 
This is caused by sound bouncing around inside of and diffracting off this terrible baffle. You can actually see that these peaks switch as we go off axis. This suggests that sound power is pretty even and the reflections from the room will likely smooth this out quite a lot. Now it's time to design the crossover. A lot of people seem to think that a crossover simply splits the signal into highs for the tweeter and lows for the woofer. But if that's true, why does this one-way speaker that doesn't even have a tweeter have a crossover inside it? I see a crossover as a problem solving tool. It handles things like directivity, breakup and phase. More importantly, it handles baffle step, where low frequencies tend to wrap around and are lost behind the speaker, while higher frequencies tend to beam straight forward at the listener, sounding much louder. This is V2X CAD. It's incredible. You can import your measurements, then design and tune your crossover. It will show you in real time, with a high level of accuracy, how your speaker will perform. Here's my amplifier. If I connect it straight up to the woofer, we can see some problems. Baffle step is clearly visible, causing this big hump in the response. There's also a bunch of messy stuff up here caused by diffraction and breakup. To fix the baffle step, we can use an inductor, one of these coils, to bring the big hump under control. But the higher frequencies are still quite messy. Adding a capacitor like this in parallel with the woofer cleans that up but its effect is a bit strong, so I'll also add a resistor in parallel with the woofer to soften its effect a bit. Now that the woofer's looking good, let's hook up the tweeter. The tweeter is much louder than the woofer, so we need a resistor to bring it down a bit. It's also clashing with the woofer, so we have to filter out the low frequencies with a capacitor. It's looking better, but we need a bit more, so let's add an inductor in parallel with the tweeter. This inductor works with our capacitor to make a stronger second order filter. All right, the response is looking pretty good now. It's fairly flat for this type of speaker and the in-room response is nice and linear. The minimum impedance isn't too low for our amplifier and because the crossover point is high, the component values are small. Once you've designed your crossover in V2X CAD, you can build a physical crossover like this. It sits between our amplifier and our drivers, giving us the same frequency response we designed for in V2X CAD. I like to print a crossover board like this that has all the component values labeled on one side and then all the wiring paths labeled on the other. This way I don't mix anything up when I'm putting it together. All the plans on my website printyourspeakers.com include a file for a board like this. This makes assembly easy, even for first timers. I skipped over a lot of the fine tuning, but this is crossover design. You don't have to be an electrical engineer. You really can just play around with different combinations of resistors, inductors and capacitors until you get a response you like. Now that I'm done designing it, I can assemble a beautiful crossover like this. It's sounding pretty good. Hearing this much bass come out of a speaker that looks like this is quite odd. I've measured it as well and there's a few little discrepancies but that's not what's worrying me. What's worrying me is the port noise. Take a listen to this. That port noise sounds like someone blowing through a straw. I thought I could get away with using a tiny little woofer and a tiny little port like this but I was wrong. Now I have a real problem because there's a lot that needs to fit inside this tiny little speaker and it's not as simple as just making this hole bigger. If I increase the port area, tuning frequency is going to increase along with it. So to bring it back down again, I have to make the port longer too. This is starting to worry me a bit. And I know some genius is about to comment. Why not just use a passive radiator? Well, firstly, that'd be cheating. Secondly, they're actually really expensive. And you can't just use a passive radiator. They have to move twice as much air as the woofer, so you need two per speaker. And the biggest reason is that it's fucking impossible. Where are you gonna put them? Anyway, time to print the next prototype. I'm pretty happy with how this has come out. The offset port in the back I think is actually pretty cute. The only issue is, is that I don't think this plate amp's gonna fit, so I'll have to tweak that a bit. But I'm still gonna test it just to make sure we've actually fixed the port noise. Still no good. This is starting to get scary. I'm already worried there is enough room inside the speaker for all these parts. And now the port has to get even bigger. Maybe my imaginary YouTube commenter was right. Maybe I should just use a passive radiator. Just kidding. I'm not giving up that easily. This is 3D printed audio and I've still got a few tricks up my sleeve. I can hide parts of the port in the walls of the cabinet and fold it up in three dimensions, which should give me a bit more space. If you doubt how good 3D printing can be for speakers, you just try and build something like this out of wood. But I have to admit, 
Drawing a port like this in Fusion is not a trivial task. It's amazing how big this board is getting. I mean, look where we started. It's going to be so much harder to fit everything inside this speaker now. The other issue is that the tweet is rear mounted, so there's no way for me to get inside to unscrew it. So I'm having to use this incredibly delicate technique to open the speaker up. Because of all the changes I made, I ended up having to fully remeasure and redesign the crossover, but I got it down to four parts, which is nice. All right, so I'm finally making some progress. This is the version that's gonna have the plate amp, which is looking pretty good on the back and fitting really nicely underneath the port. But what I'm really proud of is this. These are the front panel controls. They're nice, but they don't really match the aesthetic of the speaker. So what I'm gonna do is bury them inside the front baffle. So made a little space for them there. And then these custom buttons go over the top. And there you go. Custom buttons that you can print in whatever color you like, whatever logos you want on them you like, and they can match the aesthetic of the speaker. At this point, you're probably wondering where the crossover is gonna go. I mean, we could stick it on the front of the port like this, but that isn't gonna work because that's where the woof is gonna sit. We could stick it on the side like this, but then I won't be able to get an Allen key to the screws to be able to hold it in. So what I've come up with is I'm gonna screw it to the back of the baffle here. I have test fit this and it does seem to fit, but fingers crossed. It's time. Will this fit inside this? If this doesn't work, we might need a complete redesign. So let's see how we go. victory. What I hope is the final prototype is all together. I've just got the one speaker at the moment, so we'll have to listen in mono, but I've got it hooked up to power at the back and Bluetooth on my phone, so let's have a listen. Still not over the bass from this thing. It doesn't look like it should have any, but honestly, you have to hear it to believe it. One issue I'm having though is these buttons are rattling terribly. So I think my genius idea needs a little bit more refinement. I think refinement's been achieved. I printed four different buttons. Each adds a different amount of preload to the switch underneath. And I think 0.25 mil of load is perfect. I don't think this is rattling at all and the button still works great, so. I think we're ready to make the final speaker. They're done. Yes. It really took me five weeks to get here, but all this work has finally paid off. They really turned out nicely in this grey. I think it really captures that 90s classic computer speaker look. And they sound great. Just listen to the difference between these and Apple's computer speakers. And if you had it told me I could get a response this flat with this baffle design and just four crossover components, I would not have believed you. Just look how they compare to the Apple speakers. That 15 dB bump in the highs explains why they sound so tinny. But I didn't make these speakers for me. Let's see what Dr. Robert thinks of them. All right, Robert, what do you think of the sound? Well, they play audio with bass, reasonable quality, and they don't interfere with my screen. That's all I can ask for, because I honestly couldn't find any other ones that weren't either old and distorted or they interfered with the screen, so... Awesome. Yeah. I'm calling that a success. 
This whole experience has given me huge respect for the engineers that design these small affordable speakers. People admire these huge expensive systems, but honestly, it's hard not to make a huge speaker with pricey components sound great. Designing a small speaker on a tiny budget, that's the real challenge. I have plans to take on the likes of Bose and JBL and build a little portable Bluetooth speaker, but I'm gonna save that one for when I emotionally recover from this project. In the meantime, you can find the plans for the mid-90s at printyourspeakers.com. Links in the description. In the next video, I'm tackling center channels, so I'll see you then.